spare your breath, you hear me? Uh, now go now, go, why you still can't? Let's go! If you're seeing this broadcast, you are in a part of the country no longer controlled by the government of the United States. Republican National Convention is currently going on right now. Um, of course, we had heard about the police shooting here on Sunday. Um, quite a few other things that are going on uh, today in the news. Deutsche Bank is now closing over 200 branches in the nation of Germany out there. Um, we've been hearing things. Um, if you haven't been paying attention, um, that's not good. I believe what I heard is $42 trillion in derivatives being exposed. Uh, another thing that's going to happen is uh, Italy's bank crisis. Those things are happening. You can catch up with news at barry-julie.blogspot.com. Keep up to date with things that are currently going on. Um, I do the best I can, uh, but things are going to come more rapid, more faster and faster. It's going to get really hard. One of the things I've always heard is that the majority is not always right. And we can see that with Noah. We can uh, even see that with um, Joseph. Um, you know, people just didn't believe in the dreams and that and also believe what uh, Noah was doing. You can see multiple times that people spoke about things that were coming to pass and were not he uh, heeded by the, the majority. The majority then was outside of Noah's boat. They were believers, but it was too late after the door shut. So on tonight's broadcast, um, we had already prayed that the veil would be taken off people's ears, eyes, and heart. Things are happening so quickly that I believe that so many people are not being concerned with what's happening i just mentioned just a few things but tonight we have um stan grant from in defense of a radio in defense of a nation radio show now he's been doing a lot of different things that's been going on trying to wake up people you can go to his website in defense of a nation dot com you want to check out currently what he's talking about um you can also go down to his media button um i would really highly encourage you to uh, check out in defense of a nation archives and also faith that overcomes archives there are things that are that our nation uh, has been called by god and uh, so many are not seeing what's happening anyway with that being said stan grant welcome to in time talk radio hey thanks barry it's good to be back with you it's been a long time it has um you know um I, i've taken about a year off when we moved down here in the ozarks and uh, now that being said um yeah, I, I see the seriousness of what's happening. Things are happening faster and faster. Stan, you know, before we kind of really delve into all these different things, could you tell the people about your radio show? Uh, yeah, you uh, you captured the website that they can go to. It's in defense of a nation dot com, and uh, um, the the show in defense of a nation. It's myself and my brother Steve, who pastors uh, Destiny Christian Center in Greeley, and then there's a panel of. Uh, other subject matter experts that we engage um, often on the show, and uh, so we discuss basically headlines as they're occurring and lay them against political events, but you know, more importantly, what we're trying to do is to get ahead of the headlines and uh, 
show people in God's Word what is coming um, so that they can connect to that and have some sense of stability because the wheels are about to come off, I believe. Well, I was looking on your um, oh your Facebook page, and uh, the last thing you posted, posted, for those who haven't noticed, the rules of engagement between good and evil have changed. Posting blah, 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 black, um, blah, lies, black Lives Matter on your Twitter account or Facebook hasn't saved anyone, nor will it. The time for the battle draws nigh. Are you ready? And I noticed someone says, well, what battle? And I'm hearing that a lot. And not many people are understanding there's a battle coming to our country. Yeah, they're clueless, actually. Um, they uh, they see the Macy's Day or the Macy's 50% off sale coming this weekend, and they're just you know taking the kids to soccer games and all of that stuff, and they're blind to the events that are unfolding around them. And so we're doing what we can to show them in God's Word. Hey, here's here's what you're about to face, and life as we know it is going to change in America. I think pretty quick. You know, and Stan, when we moved uh, from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, and I had talked to Pastor Steve about this. There was a quite a leap of faith. But now we're seeing the moment that we moved now. It's taken over now just over a year since we moved. And, you know, it's a hard thing to do. But now I'm beginning to see now we're more set. we got our nest and that going on. Been, you know, it takes about a year to get set up once you move. Um, with that being said, where you lived in Cheyenne, you really couldn't have a necessity of living off the grid in the sense of you know heating your um, your house in case it gets cold because there's no trees up there in Cheyenne, Wyoming, unless you go 150 miles away, uh, where we're at, we have a lot better chance of living through things that are happening, and not many people are understanding that we're so close that they really need where they're going to be residing will be where they out will be when let's say martial law and different things like that happen. You know, um, I had somebody we were talking about this a while back, Barry, and we were just talking about simple geography and where you live. Um, the Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps round about those that fear him. Okay, and so somebody was saying to me, well, you're going to be able to live anywhere, and God's going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked him a simple question. How did that work for the 20 million Christians in Soviet Russia, in the Soviet Union, that lost their lives in the 1930s as compared to, say, the zero that lost their lives for their faith that lived in America? Does that mean that the Christian in Soviet Russia was less of a Christian? No, I think they were probably better Christians uh, than the Christian in America in the 1930s. But the difference was where they lived. Mm -hmm. It all came down to geography and the system that they were living under. And so where Christians live today, I think, is of utmost importance. And your geography could play a role in whether or not you're going to make it or whether or not you will not in the days that are ahead. You could be very saved and very dead. <laughs> you know, and and that's so simple to say, but it is so very true. You know, Stan, with that being said, I've been kind of keeping my ears up to what's going on, Cheyenne, where I have family up there still, and 35,000-plus Muslims now have gone through Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, Section 8 housing, and, and now, of course, now they're showing up on the streets more and more. Um, you know, to the average Christian, we're finding out that a lot of churches are just like, well, hey, you know, wait, we can get these people saved. Yeah, I uh, I run into that a lot, and, and that is completely contrary to God's pattern for bringing salvation to the lost. Nowhere does he say, bring them into your house and corrupt it. Yeah, that is so true. Um, and that being said, um, now we're seeing the Southern Baptists are telling people, hey, literally open up your doors to your home and bring these people in. Well, we're seeing what's going on in Germany. They're already disrupting people's personal lives in their homes. Um. Yeah, I think a lot of modern Christians have been hit upside the head with the dumb stick. Number one, they don't know who America is in Scripture. They don't know what's coming. And they're taking Scriptures that apply to personal salvation and trying to uh, paint them as national policy. And the number one, the number one um, purpose for government, and you'll see this in Romans chapter 13, it's to be a protection over its citizenry and to punish those which are doing evil, not bring them in. Mm-hmm. And we rever reverse that totally. Totally. You know, Stan, in your last radio show, um, Waldo, where's heaven? Um, you know, that re that has totally put a paradigm shift. What is being taught in a church? Um, so often we're told that, hey, we go to heaven, and we're actually seeing in the scripture because so often we read the word, 
but we never study it. And so what happens is we glissfully go over it with the majority saying, well, heaven's at this place. This is where it's talking about. But when you really read it and, and study it, it's actually saying heaven is somewhere here on earth. Yeah, what you're referring to, of course, is what we've been studying is Revelation chapter 12. And I believe there's an invisible heaven out there. I, I think the Bible refers to that as your third heaven. Mm -hmm. Paul refers to somebody and he says whether he was in body or not, I don't know. But he was caught up to the third heaven and he saw and heard things that are unspeakable here on earth. So I think that there are layers of heaven. But a lot of people just see heaven on the printed page in Scripture and assume that it all applies to the third heaven. So what we did... We've been studying Revelation chapter 12, and in that passage, you see that there's a woman. She's clothed with the sun, the moon, and the stars. She's standing on the moon, and and she's in heaven. Okay, but yet you see then that uh, there's there's this war that takes place, and the, the people overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. So death is possible in this heaven. People look at scripture and they say that that is the literal heaven but what they don't understand is that that is a symbolic reference used to portray something that's happening here on earth um, it's a place where the enemy has gained a foothold where there's a war where satan's intimidating persecuting trying to take over and mortality exists there and so we've gone into revelation 12 because i think it's one of the most important passages that americans should understand today because we're about to see it you know when i first read your book years ago i don't know three four years ago and i'm laying in my bed in cheyenne wyoming and first or second chapter i mean stan i was hooked i mean you know how it is when somebody gets healed they believe the word and it changes them something in there clicks and everything about their life changes they're no longer in infirm when i read your book everything in my life changed and i didn't realize how much it would change um it actually caused us to move because of what we've seen and you know I'll stand at first when I first started listening to yourself and your brother um, I was like who are these guys but as I listened and let the word you know grow in me it talks about in Matthew you know it fell on good ground and someone rocking that and you know it at first I was like where are you guys coming from but as I listened that foundation was built and I started understanding things that the majority was saying opposite of what you're saying have you ever noticed, Barry, that when you, because you meet people. Yes. Um, you meet a lot of new people. Have you ever noticed that you can say the same thing to one person and then to say the same thing to another person and to another, and they all respond differently? They do. You know, some people, it just really hits them, and other people just, you know, they just kind of shrug their shoulders and go on. And I think that's what Jesus is illustrating in the parable of the sower, because he says the sower sows the seed, which is the word of God. Mm hmm that some seed falls into to the by the wayside and some falls into stony ground and thorny ground and then good ground and the thing that we've tried to tell people is that there's nothing wrong with the sower which is jesus and there's nothing wrong with the seed which is the word of god but what produce comes out of a person's life depends on how they intake that mm -hmm. you know and it's frustrating at times to see that there is so much ground by the wayside and so much thorny ground and so much stony ground there's a lot of people that you can sow truth into and they just shrug it off but then other people take it in and bam fruitfulness occurs and, and, and you, you find that when people I, I see people contact you and they're like whoa I've never seen this before of course a veil comes off and then they start learning it takes a little bit to unlearn the things that they've been taught in church but uh, once they start seeing those things boy I tell you what they, they 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 just start shooting off and they go in ways that even their friends are like you're crazy where are you going what are you doing and but god verifies by opening up doors he does this he supplies everything they need i'm sure people thought noah was crazy yeah very true yeah. <laughs> you know I'm, I'm sure i'm sure that there are men and women down throughout history what about abraham abraham get up and leave your family leave your land leave everything leave your family mm -hmm. i'm sure people thought he was crazy very true. Um, you know, I could see Noah, you know, speaking to the people, and he's building this boat. And, and I, I guess this is what gets me, Stan, is this, is in Noah's day, the water always came up. No one ever yeah. thought, no one ever thought the water would ever come down. I mean, that was something so 
you know, the, but you know, but Noah had a, a relationship with God, and God was saying, "Hey, these things are going to happen." The same thing with Joseph and Mary. You know, all these ba uh, these babies wouldn't have died if they would have realized what was happening. But they heeded the word, and they left. Uh, Noah heeded the word, and he was saved. You you bring up an interesting point because we've been teaching on Bible prophecy at Destiny Christian Center on um, every other Sunday night, and one of the things that we discussed. Uh, at our last session was how that prior to these dispensational changes, and there was a huge dispensational change between um, between in Noah's day, that Noah was the last one of that last dispensation or of that previous dispensation that survived into the new era of time. Mm -hmm. um, the disciples, for instance, they were they were preparatory as you moved into the dispensation of the New Covenant time period. They went from the Old Covenant period to the New Covenant time period. Prior to those major changes, God always prepares a people in advance, and they're not in the majority. They're a very small number. Noah was your transitional government from mm -hmm. the time period of, of the created earth to the new earth then. Uh, the disciples were your transitional government to the time period between uh, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We're coming into yet another uh, dispensational, transitional period where we're going to come into the Kingdom Age. And I think what God is doing today is He's preparing people by teaching them about Kingdom authority, Kingdom government, the Kingdom of Heaven, on Earth as it is in Heaven, those kinds of things. And He's preparing them now, before we get to that transition time, just like He had to prepare Noah before the transition. He had to prepare the disciples before the transition. And they were out of step with the norm of that day because they were being prepared for a whole new thing that was coming. And I think you're seeing some of that happen today with Christians. And there are other Christians that don't get it. Yeah, that's so true. Um, where we live, um, I'm hearing there's a gentleman that's been helping us do some electrical work, and he moved here um, oh, about four years ago. And he says, you know what's amazing to me? is these people that are willing to leave everything because he was he was quite a rich person um, but he wasn't in debt but he was quite well off and he said you know I left everything to come to this area and he said it's not been easy but he said I really know that I've done the right thing even after I'm now I'm seeing everything going on and he says the story is the same he says the stories with you uh, with multiple other people that have moved to this area that the doors have opened up it didn't make sense I walked through and God is somehow sustaining these people when it doesn't even look like they're going to be sustainable. They're walking on water, so to speak. Basically, yeah. It's uh, it's, huh. it's it is really an interesting area where we're at because of the, uh, you know, where I work at in a big box store, I come across quite a few people, and so as I'm working with people in sales, I kind of throw out things to kind of see where they're at. Um, you know, I'll, I'll talk to veterans, and I get interesting comments back when uh, I said, you know, thank you so much for standing for the U.S. Constitution. I don't say thank you for your service. I say U.S. Constitution, and that is a key word. I mean, it, they just, like, brighten up. They're like, oh, my gosh, there's somebody out there that actually knows what's what I, what I did. It wasn't just something I did, but what I really did. I, I stood for something. Yeah, it wasn't just going about, it wasn't just going out and fighting. It's, like you said, it's standing for the constituted liberties that, uh, our forefathers enumerated. They didn't give them to us. They just enumerated them for us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in my conversations with so many different people, there's people out there when you throw out words just to kind of see where they're at, you're fishing. Um, boy, some really jump on, and there's others that, well, you know, they have no clue and they go on. And, um, you know, you become really good friends with people because they understand that you're both coming from two different, you know, lives, you know, areas of the country but you're speaking the same thing that they've been put in their heart. Yeah, and I wonder how many people ask, or I wonder how many people say to our servicemen and women, thank you for standing for the Constitution. It's not a whole Probably lot. Probably not that many. No, there isn't. Um, because, you know, I, I got to thinking about this, Stan. If I tell them, thank you for your service, well, service to what? I mean, service to the, uh, the governor or to a president? No, you stood for the U.S. Constitution. And I got to thinking, you know, it's not a service. It was standing for that Constitution. That was the most important. 
Yeah, um, constituted liberty, constituted law, which, by the way, is under attack. I mean, you've seen it this, you're seeing the rise in lawlessness, and Mm -hmm. lawlessness has been emboldened. Mm -hmm. There is a spirit in the lawless ones within this nation that they're, they're being emboldened to step outside of the law. Look at Dallas, the police shootings. Look at Baton Rouge on uh, this previous Sunday. Uh, we're talking the targeted assassination of police officers, and then we have a guy that occupies the Oval Office. I can't even call him president. He's just the resident, yep. in my mind. He's a usurper. But he occupies the Oval Office, and he stands up and he says, well, the police make it a little more difficult on themselves because they won't admit when they're wrong. Mm-hmm. So a targeted assassination, and he attributes a degree of moral high ground to those that are doing that. I mean, the wheels are about to come off in our culture when that's what it's devolved into. That's nuts. One of the things that, you know, for the listener, I, I think this is so important. When Jesus came unto earth, the, the people were looking for something huge. I mean, they were missing the very things. It, it, you know, it's amazing. The very miracles that Jesus was doing, they weren't even listening to that. They were so focused on what they were taught or what they knew. And we're living in this day now that we're so, so many are so focused on a big grandeur of, hey, major things are going to happen with the Antichrist, and this is going to happen. And, and we're seeing very subtle things. To us, it's very extremely important. But to them, they're missing these things, and they're like, come on, guys. You know, you guys are thinking that we're gonna, the head's going to spin off and all this is going to happen, and you're missing the very things that are right in front of you right now. Yeah, a lot of people have taken the mysteries of God's Word and they've made them more mysterious when what we need to do is normalize them because they're going to occur in a way that appears to be normal to those living in that day. Well, that's us. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be naturally occurring events. They're not, like you said, it's not going to be the Antichrist riding into the temple on a pig and his head spins 360 degrees and his tongue is three feet long. It's not going to look like that. And so when we're looking for those things, then we get exaggerated thoughts and then we never even see what the very truth is being said to us. Um, you know, Stan, with these things being said, and, you know, I know it's hard for sometimes for a listener because this can be new for some people. Um, you know, I know for myself, it was something that, hey, it, 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 it spoke. My wife at first um, was like, well, where's this coming from? But as God worked in my heart and worked on her heart, um, we were in unity through this whole thing. Yeah, well, um, sometimes it takes that unlearning process, like you mentioned a little bit ago. I had to go through my own set of unlearning because when I read certain portions of Scripture, I had preconceived ideas based on what I'd been taught. And what I'd been taught wasn't necessarily wrong, but it was just the level of revelation that was needed for previous generations. Well, I need more revelation today. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, so Stan, those being said, what are some things that you're... I know you're going to have your next show up here on Thursday. Um, what are some things... If I can kind of maybe open up the, the lid and have you maybe kind of squeak some stuff out. What are some things that you're going to see in the next few weeks or a few months maybe happening? Well, here's one thing that we're, we're watching for. Um, and When does this program air, by the way? Are you going to air this tonight? I will try to get it up tonight if I can. So some, sometime this week during the week of the RNC in Cleveland? Yes. Okay, so we're in, our, we're in convention week what, when this is going to air. Um, one of the things that we're watching and that we're speculating on, again, we don't have a thus saith the Lord, but we're watching um, to see what happens with the convention in Cleveland because I think we're entering into a time of travail. This is, this is Monday as of when we're recording this, but we've got a whole week of convention ahead of us, um, so we can't foresee what that's going to look like. But one of the things we're looking for as a trigger is, uh, rioting or protesting that goes south in a hurry in Cleveland. Again, we don't know. Um, another thing, then, that we're looking for is a potential for an economic collapse in the fall of this year. And then I believe that there's a good possibility that Trump could be elected in November and never make it to the, the inauguration in January. I believe that there's a good chance that he could be elected assassinated sometime between November and January. And at that point, the wheels come off, and Obama just says, I'm going to stay in power. And the other nations of the world that are licking their lips to get at us, I think, would jump in on that, because you'd see civil war and then all-out war at that point. You know, so, so off... That's, oh, go ahead. That's the, perfect, that's the perfect storm that I see brewing. Is it going to blow over? Well, only time will tell. But I think that conditions are ripe for something like any of those three events to just pop. 
we just seen early or late last week um, Putin had just got rid of a whole bunch of commanders that would not fire on Western and US ships what are you seeing with Russia well we know what Russia's up to because you know the Word of God direct uh, addresses them specifically in mm -hmm. Ezekiel 38 and 39 being Gog and then Magog with the other communist alliance nations that are with them so we know Russia's going to be pivotal in making a move against us at some point in the days that are ahead and I think it could be under the Obama residency mm -hmm. before he leaves office. So the war machine's warming up. We're not. We are not coming into a time of peace. I know. I've seen and even even China's even talking about wrapping things up now too. Yeah, you know, and, and that's again. This is the shift that Christians need to understand. We've got prophets today that are saying peace, peace when there is no peace, just like they did in Jeremiah's day. And they're saying we need to have unity and group hug and love each other and all those kinds of things. Well, that's fine in a standard time period, but we're not coming into that time period. We're coming into a time of separation, of division, and it's going to get ugly before it gets better. And that's, again, another reason why we go so heavily into the prophetic word, so that people understand that. There is a shift coming, and life as usual is going to end. Yeah, and... Uh that's what uh, that's the hardest part when you try to tell family or, or friends or whoever and um, they just they go keep going on like with our jobs and everything else is going to be just fine and um, we're seeing you in the economy here just getting worse and worse all the time um, with that being said Stan is um, when you guys are doing on your prophecy on Sunday nights um, are you guys how are, are you are you like are you taking a section and then kind of building on upon it or or how are you doing that on Sunday nights yeah, we we started with uh, with some with identifying a timeline, how how God has revealed Himself throughout history to mankind, and and where we're at today on the timeline. Um, and there's an aspect of that that's speculative because, you know, for instance, referring to the return of Christ, it says no man knows the day nor the hour, so we can't pinpoint that. But I think it's First Thessalonians five one says that we should know the times and the seasons. So we started with a broad perspective of where we're at in human history on the timeline um, then we're going to take it and expand into who America is in scripture and really drill down on what people can expect as we move into what scripture refers to as the last days do you know if that's being recorded for uh, people to, ch uh, to maybe uh, listen to in the future yeah I believe it is oh um, okay I, yeah I, I do believe it is being recorded uh, and you could probably contact the church Destiny Christian Center um, you could just go to my website, indefenseofanation.com, and we've got a contacts um, drop down on there, and they can go to the contacts and then email Steve. He's the he's the pastor of the church, so then he'd get those and uh, could tell people when that's going to be made available. But um, you know, Paul or Peter refers to prophecy as a light that shines in a dark place. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of caves there in the Ozarks where you live. Yes. If you went into a cave, what's the one thing that you would want? A light. You'd want a flashlight, yeah. So when, when Peter says the prophetic word is like a light that shines in a dark place, what he's telling us is, hey, guys, that's your flashlight. It doesn't get you saved, but it'll help you navigate. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been in there where they turn the lights off, and most people probably that been listening haven't seen that too. I mean, you have no bearing. You have no where you're at. You just feel like you're in the middle of, I, I don't know how a person would get out of a cave without a light. Um, yeah. And so right now with the chaos, I know people at my job, they're getting a little uneasy, you know, especially with all these cop killings, like what is going on? And, of course, they try to push it off. And I had to mention a few things just to kind of see where people are at. And, boy, I tell you what, people are very scared right now. What's the, uh, what has been the response? Because I know the area you're in. I won't say it over the air but mm -hmm. um you know certainly not big city but w what has been the response do people have the not in my backyard um mindset like it'll never happen here or what are they saying about it i would say that uh, out of about 100 people there's two others that i know that i can freely open and talk with and they understand what's going on and most others they look at you like why should i worry about it? it's not here i mean it's not bugging me um <laughs> 
know? And I'm like going, well, you know, and, and, and I like to, I like to kind of find out where people are at because it's like, okay, when things kind of get really bad, I have to kind of know who I can depend on and who I can't. Yeah, you want to know who you're, what do they say, keep your friends close and your enemies closer? Very true. Yeah, you want you want to know who's who. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of people out here that are, they go to church, but they have no clue. I mean, you, you see them every day. They, they, they come in and or every Sunday they come in and they're buying stuff and, and they're acting like nobody else, you know, everybody else. And they have no clue what's going on. You can see it in their faces. Like everything's just fine. When is the last time you went to a church and they taught on prophecy from the perspective that you will be here to experience this? Because I know a lot of them teach on it from the perspective that you don't have to worry about this because you won't be around because you're going to be raptured. Yeah, and that's what the very thing. Now, I have not walked into a church here only because usually I work on Sundays, but the people that I've known that have gone to churches, they said they're dead. And there's just nothing there. Um, it's the same thing you'd see at other places. And so you get a good message on how to get saved. Basically. And it's true. It's 100% truth, but um, it's still the, the people are still blind to what they need for today. They don't have the flashlight in the cave, the prophetic word. And uh, and so, like you said, you know, it's, it's not in their backyard. So why should they have to worry about what's currently happening in our country? They're just not too worried about it. Um, and I'm seeing now more and more, not so much right here, but other places in our country that. Um, they're embracing Allah because, well, hey, Allah just means another form of God. So, hey, I can pray to Allah because, well, it's just another God I can pray to because it's the same God, the name. Yeah, and, and Allah will ask you to give your son's life, but yet God gave his son's life for us. Different God. Isn't that interesting? And And the church has gone so far that they don't understand the difference anymore. Well, I was reading an article earlier today, and it, it even mentioned that the majority now of Christians sitting in church, 65% of Christians sitting in church, believe that cohabitation before marriage is the best thing to do because, after all, you want to see if you're sexually compatible. Hmm, interesting. I, you know, often at work, I'll get people, they come into church, out of church, and they'll come into the job site, and um, they'll say, well, do you go to church? And I, I want so bad to say, you know, I mean, I just tell you know, I'll tell them no. I'll tell them like, yeah, I do this on, and I want so bad to say, well, why do I have to go to church? You know, I, I but I can't do that at my job. You know, I want to, I want to kind of, you know, take it a little bit further. You know, well, why are you asking me to go to church? Because, um, you know, if you tell them, well, why should I go to church? They will have no good, reasonable answer. They're like, well, you want to go there because you can fellowship with people, understand that. But what's beyond that? They have no other answers to really kind of give. You just know that. That's what they're going to basically say. Well, church has become something we do or something we go to, and God never, Christ never set it up as such. Mm -hmm. Church is something that we are. Yeah, and so, anyways, Stan, what are some other things that you're that you're kind of working on that you're seeing that are kind of like arousing your your eyebrows, going, oh, this is kind of interesting. Well, right now, we're, it's it's the whole, you know, our biggest red flag right now is watch, is watching what happens with Trump. Because um, I believe he is a trigger, and mm -hmm. I believe he's a flash he's a flashpoint. Um, at some point, uh, if what I see in Revelation 12 is, is correct, at some point, the woman who is, I believe, the House of Israel, and that's the United States, She's going to give birth to a man-child that comes forward with a message of dominance, and he's going to basically approach the other nations of the world with one message, and that is, is that we're going to rule over you. I'm going to make America great again. And it's the rise of nationalism. It's not, it, it's not the rise of globalism that's in this man-child. It's the rise of nationalism. Now, a lot of people read Revelation 12, and they say, oh, well, that's a picture of Mary when she gave birth to Jesus. That's a historical look back. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Revelation 12 is a future event, because John was shown things that must be hereafter, as it says in Revelation 4.1. So Revelation 12 is a future event. So the nation of Israel, the house of Israel, I believe is going to give birth to a leader. And that birth could be an election cycle, it could be a coup, it could be an impeachment, it could be whatever. 
But because we're coming into an election cycle, we're coming into a season of birth, uh, because of the rhetoric that Trump exhibits, he's coming forward with one message. I'm going to build the wall. I'm going to protect America. It's going to be America first, and I'm going to make America great again. The globalists hate him. Mm -hmm. The globalists from both parties hate him. Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, is working harder to stop Trump that he's ever done to stop Hillary or that he's ever than he's ever done to stop Obama mm -hmm. because he's still a globalist at heart so you're seeing this rise of nationalism in Trump's rhetoric and the people love it oh yeah frankly I love it. I frankly, do I love it I do too um, he's uh, got some policies that I support a hundred percent and that could be a trigger you know people hear about the House of Israel and they're like, what are you talking about? But so often, our forefathers did talk about these things in their writings. They did. They referred to us as New Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, they're in, in the earlier days of America, our forefathers understood that we were descendants from the tribes of Israel. I mean, even the Scottish Declaration of Independence, they refer to themselves as the outgoings of the House of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, penned in 1218... A.D., I think. Um, but we've lost that. We've lost the understanding of that. We've lost the knowledge of our heritage. You know, where did the Saxon come from? Isaac's sons, or apostrophe Sax's sons, were, were descendants of the tribes of Israel, so we are the house of Israel. You know, if people understood that Ezekiel 38 was dealing with America, Gog and Magog attacking America, they'd read it differently. They would. And, you know, uh, there's times, you know, when job applications and that, they ask you, you know, are you white Caucasian? Well, we came, you look at the Caucasian mountains over there in Europe, you you start kind of, things become very obvious to you. Yeah, because the Caucasus are just north of, of where Syria is. And as the House of Israel was taken captive out of the land of the northern ten tribes, they they were taken captive into Assyria. They went northward. And from there, they continued to migrate northward after the Assyrians let them go. They continued to migrate northward through the Caucasus. Hence, they took on the name of Caucasian and into Europe. So, you know, we started out in Israel as the ten tribes of Israel. But as we moved into Europe and as we moved into the British Isles and such, we had a new nickname, that of Caucasian and that of Saxon. Well, here we are in America today. And we're the nation of unwalled villages. We're the land that's dwelling in peace and safety. We're the nation that's gotten cattle and spoil and goods. We're the nation that Gog and Magog and then a whole host of Islamic nations want to take down. That's us. Yeah. Um, you know, and even um, when I read in First Kings, I think it's like chapter 11 or 12, it talks about the splitting of the houses right there. There's no longer Israel, but it's the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Yeah, there was a time that Israel was even at war with the Jews. And a lot of people say, well, how can that be? Because aren't they synonymous terms? And the answer is no. Because the Jews were just the other two-tribed portion of the kingdom, the house of Judah. Jew is just a nickname of Judah. So the Jew is different than the Saxon. They're related, and they're of the same united kingdom of Israel. But the house of Israel is not a Jewish entity. And a lot of people don't know that. Again, they see Israel on the printed page in the Bible. They see Israel on a map, and they say they must be the same thing, and they're not. And, you know, I was talking to your brother. Over in the area, in those three counties around Will County and that, they're going to eventually have, or they are, are pretty close to having, almost a million head of cattle. That's more than most countries out there in the world. I think Weld County, they said, has as many cattle as the entire uh, nation of Russia. So who comes for a spoil, you know? Um, Ezekiel 38 and 39, when a person reads that, it says the prophet is speaking specifically to the house of Israel. Yeah, and they want stuff. They want cattle and spoil and goods. So here would be then the other trigger that I would be looking for, and that's an economic collapse. And you alluded to the potential for that because of what we're seeing with Deutsche Bank. Mm -hmm. What did you say? How many branches? 200 branches? 200 branches, one quarter of their their uh, banks are going going down or okay. yeah okay so look at look at then what's happening with with that situation um let's just war game or or throw some scenarios out and we could go into scripture if we had time but we don't have time for it 
today. Um, let's just say, or let's just imagine what would happen if your peg currency collapsed. The peg currency is, of course, the dollar. Mm-hmm. Everybody talks about what's happened in Zimbabwe when their currency collapsed and they had hyperinflation, and the Weimar Republic prior to World War II and those kinds of things. Well, those things were bad, but none of those occurred to the global peg currency. Just imagine what happens if the dollar collapses, if the U.S. economy suffers complete collapse. You have no economy for anybody in the world at that point. Yeah. Nobody. I mean, America catches a cold, but the world gets a flu mm-hmm. at that point. So you have no economic peg anymore. Okay, and then you've got um, nations that are in bed with us because of the monetary whoredoms that we're committing with them. But when that's all gone, you're looking at Russia, you're looking at China, you're looking at Islam, you're looking at nations that really ideologically hate us. And Mm -hmm. now they hate us, and there's no more reason to be in bed with us because the economy's gone bunk, and everybody's broke. And you've got an army, and you've got nuclear weapons. What are you going to do? You're going to say, let's go take it from them. I think there's your premise right there for Ezekiel 38. We're coming to take cattle and spoil and prey and goods. So I'm looking for Trump to be a flashpoint. I'm looking for him to rise and be assassinated and and to see that as a trigger point within our nation. I'm also looking for there to be a dollar or a banking collapse that at that point the other nations of the world say, well, what have we got to lose? Let's just go take it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it makes total sense. I mean, we're the number one nation in the world that has all this stuff. Let's go take it because they're suffering because now the whole economy has gone downhill. Yeah. And we're all broke, but at least they've got stuff. So let's go take their stuff. And, you know, when, uh, now in Greeley, with all the Muslims being, you know, positioned there, I'm hearing about, you know, uh, they had um, oh there was something that was mentioned about um, Russians being here and the people that have already been came from Russia are going uh, guys you need to realize that there's there's things that are happening that you guys are getting set up so that when things happen that they're going to come in and take you everything that you guys have. I had a neighbor when I lived down there, and she uh, immigrated over here 25 years ago from the Czech Republic, and so she saw firsthand what it was like to live under Soviet tyranny, because she grew up in the Czech Republic when they were under the USSR regime. And she told me flat out, she said, you buy food, you buy guns, you buy ammo. She said, I can't believe how stupid the Americans are. I'm seeing happen right here in America what I left the Czech Republic to get away from. Yeah. Um, And, you know, now that Obama's, now he's going to be starting trying to go for the gun grabbing, um, and and I, I I know there will be a lot of Americans that will give up their guns. I know there will be. Not this one. <laughs> the one bullet at a time, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 and, and I, I, where I work at, I tell you what, they are just literally. Uh, if you even have a pocket knife, they're just like, oh my gosh, you got a weapon, and I just and I should have took a picture of it today. I walked into the bank, and it always said, you know. Concealed carry of a gun is not allowed here, but now there's a new sign up. It says, "Wearing sunglasses or a big coat, um, you must take off your sunglasses and your coat." And I'm like, "Well, where did that sign just come from?" I'm like, "Going, my gosh! I mean, they're having all these things now. They're trying to throw out the innocent person that's doing nothing is the one that they're going after. When all these other guys are the ones that are coming after them." Seriously, they're telling you that you can't wear a. A big coat and sunglasses into the bank. Basically, yeah. Um, they want you to take your sunglasses off. And I'm like going, I should have took, the, I should have took, you know what, maybe I'll, uh, next guy or day or two, I'll get a chance, I'll, I'll run down there and, and take a picture. You should, you should take a picture and post that on your blog. I, I will do that, because that's like, I, I, I didn't even think it at the time, I just walked in there because I had some business to take care of, and, and I'm like going, seriously, you cannot wear sunglasses in the bank. I mean, I understand it's going to be darker than outside, but I mean, what am I, what am I trying to hide my eyes? And the guy that's up to no good, he's not really going to care. Yeah, he just walk in there. And, you know, you see different shops. And I'm amazed in this area down here 
how many uh, signs are up saying, you know, this is a gun-free zone or whatever. And I'm like, you guys are just crazy. Now, wait a minute. You're in the middle of redneck country. Mm-hmm. You would think it'd be the opposite. I know, but the, it's the corporations that have done it. Let's put it that way. Corporate offices. Mm-hmm. And so you're getting the government with corporate corporation working together to say, okay, citizens, you have to do it this way. You can no longer be, um, you can no longer carry a gun constitutionally. Or, you know what I mean? I've been down there, and I've heard firsthand the, the, the cannons going off in the woods around, and I know Bubba's got guns. Yeah. And, you know, now that that they're talking about doing the, what they call the assault rifle ban and stuff, I know that there's some people that have talked to at work. Uh, one guy that's starting to wake up, he says, you know, I'm going to buy uh, whatever I'm going to buy. Um, and so when I start hearing people that have not been awake and are starting to wake up, things are getting pretty serious. Yeah. Um, you're, I, I'm hoping that uh, it's not too late for some folks. They uh, they had mentioned that eight percent of America, or twenty five million around there, uh, barely make enough money with two or three jobs for the necessities. That's it. And they said, for those people to buy even like gold and silver, guns, ammo, extra food, they cannot do it. And they said that it, that in, that it, uh, it percentage is cre- increasing every month or every week. Uh, and so pretty soon it's going to be 10% of the population won't be able to afford anything. At what point, well, you know, here here's an example. You have Amendment 69 now coming in Colorado. And from what some stuff I'm reading about, they can almost take 10% of what a person makes right out of their paycheck, additionally to all the taxes they have now. At what point does our economy go down because people just cannot support all these taxes? I think we're getting close to that point. I mean, I, I think that's actually why Obamacare was instituted. I don't think it was to provide for insurance coverage for the needy. I think it was deliberately designed to collapse the economy. We're burden it so that it collapses, so that then government, so government creates the problem, so that then they can come in and impose their solution, and the citizen becomes serfs. Yeah, and, and, you know, and so often they just don't think about it. They just do. They're like uh, automatons. They just don't, when you... It's funny how people have, they have gone through education of colleges to no longer think for themselves now. And you see it every day. Oh, have you seen these guys that interview people on the streets and they ask them about the Declaration of Independence? I saw one a while back and it was a July 4th. They said, why does the July 4th exist? And they said, well, it's Independence Day. And they said, Independence from who? And these college kids didn't even know who who we fought. They didn't even know what the Revolutionary War was about. One guy just said, well, it's a day to celebrate freedom and we light fireworks. And he had no clue of the historical context behind it. And this was on a major uh, U.S. college campus. And, and, you know, Stan, you know, these people are no longer thinking for them. They have a degree, but they can't even think for themselves. And people are just doing things because they're told to. And when it comes down to thinking for themselves, they get scared of someone who does think for themselves because you're going outside the uh, the bounds of, you know, it's just, it's just it, it takes them out of their, their comfort zone. And so they're conditioned to be sheep. Yes. And so that being said, I have met people here that are willing to stand, and there's some people that, uh, there, are, there are people here that are probably to, willing to stand more than you th- than I think, uh, they're just being very quiet. They're kind of watching what's going on. Um, but I'm kind of one of those people. I, I I love to ask questions of people, you know, and, you know, especially when I'm at work. I like if if they're willing to kind of go further, then I like to, you know, delineate into more things. And sometimes you have some interesting conversations. And, um, you know, I can, I can name quite a few things, but every once in a while I'll hear something that's really interesting and I'm like, going, hey, I got to type this up and, and do a red flag. I'm going, okay, guys, this is what I heard. This is very interesting. Um, you know, one of the things I had heard here, Stan, um, from a gentleman that was, um, oh, gosh, um, it was a customer that I had met. And he told me, he says, you won't believe what I just heard. And I said, like, what? And he says, I was just talking to a former deputy sheriff in this area. And he said that 
there was an area that, that was built and they were stashing items of protection I'm I'm being vague um for the the it, the Muslim attack upon America and there's so they're they're preparing for an Islamic attack yes but that's something you just don't hear all the time but these people realize that these people are coming in and so you know you ever once what you hear little things out there and you're like oh my gosh you know you you know you're not afraid or nothing like that you just like going wow that's just another cue to what's happening it just confirms god's word mhm um you know and and one of the things that i'm learning more and more is that there are three kinds of people and we've had conversations about this and read books about this there's the sheep mm -hmm. there's the wolf and then there's the sheep dog yep. and sheep dogs are far and few between they stand up and they watch what's going on with the flock and they're watching for the wolf and they're the ones that bark and they bite and they annoy the sheep you know but a lot of times what we're doing it's like being a sheep dog and you can't expect the sheep to understand that. Um, and I've had to I've had to learn that more and more and more. You never take a sheep and turn them into a sheep dog. I think it's a gift and a calling. Um, but we do annoy the sheep. Just like an alarm clock annoys me in the morning. But you know what? I need it. Otherwise, I'm going to be late for work, lose my job. You know, so I need that thing that annoys me. So I think, you know, as you do talk to people on your job and, you know, as you do your broadcast and we're on the air back here and we're doing the things that we can, I think it's just important that as we see the wolf, we just keep barking. And keep warning. <laughs> More so than ever. Um, and, you know, I'm waiting. My mom right now, she went and um, she's up in Wyoming right now at this time and and so I like to kind of find out from her what she's seeing now that she's been gone from there for about a year now. I like to kind of find out uh, what she's seeing and uh, different things up there. Cause I do hear reports on, on some things up there. And and I, I, I do keep up on some of the Facebook postings from governmental things that are going on. And, and one thing I do notice is that so many people up there, they're still doing the political thing. You know, well, if we do this and everybody runs here and then, well, if we do this and everybody runs there, I'm like going... Do you guys realize that they're not even heeding the rule of law anymore and you guys are trying to do this? Aren't you guys even getting ready for the war that's ensuing? And they don't understand that. No, the sheep keep grazing. And, and all you can do is keep barking. <laughs> you know, being, being the sheepdog. And when the wolf comes, you know, who's going to be the first one to go after the wolf? It's going to be the sheep. You know, so it's just it's just part of I think the way God has designed us and what He's gifted us to do. But uh, yeah, I admit it does get frustrating, and I think it gets frustrating for the sheep too because they're annoyed by us. It's a realization I had to come to one day. I annoy people. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and I'm kind of just wondering in your area down there where you're at in that Greeley area and that. Um, how are you seeing things down there now? Over, you know, it's been a year since we've been gone. Um, you know, we're seeing different things happen. Are you seeing visible signs of more Muslims coming in and, and, and different things like that? I think actually fewer because because there's been some heat applied in Weld County and, and with some of the uh, ag businesses and food processing plants and stuff like that, there was some some heat brought against some of them. And so some of those people have actually gone to Cheyenne. Which is not a good deal because now Cheyenne is like, well, hey, we'll just give you guys free Section 8 housing up here. Sure, yeah. So I think that I think that there is a movement underway more in northern Colorado to to uh, stand against their uh, their ideology because they're not they're not coming in as immigrants. They're coming in as settlers. There's the, the conformity that they have in mind is not that they're going to conform to the ways of us. They're going to conform us even on pain of death once they get to that point. Numbers. It'll be, it'll be convert or die. So yeah. they're coming in as settlers to try to change our way of life. And I, I think there's some pushback going on in northern Colorado in large part, again, because of Destiny Christian Center. And I, I tell you, I love that church. I mean, I wish we were there because there's really no churches that are like that. Um, 
No, I have a I have a a family member up there in Cheyenne, and they have a boss that's a Muslim, and their husband is the head of the mosque up there in Cheyenne. And this was a year ago, so I don't know if his cha- had bosses changes, but um, yeah, yeah, they they love that they love those people. I mean, they're like, going, hey, there's nothing they could do. They're they're great people, and you can't get through to telling them that hey, there's some things happening. And, and you're referring to the refugees that they're bringing in and such? Yes. Yeah, well, you know, Jesus said, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say bring all the nations in and corrupt your And, you know, the one thing that we're to love above people is God. And there's a hierarchy to love that a lot of Christians have forgotten about, and they have put their love for humanity first. And we're to love God in his ways, and one of the ways of God is, is the way of purity. As a nation, if we're going to be a nation under God, we've got to ded- our, dedicate ourselves to being pure in the expression of that. We can't bring people in that want to corrupt it. And we've fallen for the lie of trying to be unity as one world. we got all got to come together, and God doesn't want that. He wants nationalities. Yeah, you can't... You can't really celebrate diversity and, until you first have distinctions. Mm-hmm. You, can't, you can't have everything blend. If everything blends, you've got no more diversity. And I think God celebrates purity. So if we're going to be a nation under God, we've got to get back to understanding what that means, and that does not include bringing in evil. Period. It looks like, Stan, that we're coming to that point where when all this hits, the revival will happen after it hits. Yeah. It's not going to happen before. We're gonna, we're gonna, Zion's going to be redeemed with, with judgment. The bottom's going to have to fall out and the wheels are going to have to fall off before I think get God is able to deal with this nation. As you read the Bible, do you find more things that you're like going, wow, I've never seen this, and it, it kind of just adds to what you're seeing, and you're like going, hey, Steve, check this out. This is what i just seen. Oh, yeah, we do that. We do that on a regular basis, um, you know, and I try to make it a point to reread the entire Bible every year or two just to, just because you can read a scripture a hundred times, and all of a sudden you read it the hundred and first time, and it just pops off the page. And a whole new, a whole new revelation starts to take shape. Well, you know, standing in the, in the waning minutes here, is there anything else that God has put on your heart that you wanted to share that we haven't covered? Well, I think, I think you know, this has been a pretty good synopsis of some of the things that I'm looking for. I, I pray, you know. You and I and some of the people that you know out here that we mutually know, we're, we're kind of bent towards being warriors. And, you know, one of the things that I pray is that in the absence of battle, a warrior will kind of try to make their own. Um, and I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, really save myself for the fight. And I, I, I have seen um, too many people burn out before the real battle gets there and so my prayer for me and for people like you and for listeners and such like that is that we'll just be able to see with with the eyes of God we'll be able to see from his perspective and with his perspective uh, what's going on so that we know how to respond in the days that are ahead I'm ready to see revival in this nation I wish it would get here but I really strongly believe that we're going to go through some uh, pretty tough times here soon that will precipitate that it's going to have to get worse, I think, before it gets better. While we wait, I just I want for for all of us who have those seeing eyes uh, to be able to wait with a, a grace that doesn't drive our spouses crazy, if that's like. Yep, so true, so true. Well, Stan, it sure seems like we're going to see these things happen pretty quick. The way things are kind of dribbling down in in a, in a, in a pouring matter now, that way it's pouring out. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I think between now and January, I think that, like I said earlier, it's a perfect storm that's brewing. Is it going to blow over? Well, we'll find out soon enough. But I think the atmosphere is right for the thing to just unleash. 